Welcome to Apostolic Archive. We have gathered many wonderful sermons through the years and we have decided to share them with the world. We hope you enjoy. Please subscribe to our channel. Please like the video and comment with something you take away from this message. Also, hit the bell below so you can receive an update as soon as we upload new content. Blessings. Now would you raise your hands to heaven and let's love God together. Father, we recognize your presence in this tabernacle tonight. You are in this place. There is no doubt about that. You are in this place. We love you. We thank you for what we feel. God, our faith is in you tonight. Let your blessings be upon your people tonight. God, bring encouragement and direction and understanding. Bring revelation, I pray, in this place tonight. I pray it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you. It is such a great privilege and honor to be here with you. I have enjoyed myself so very much this week. And I do want to take just a moment and say thank you to all of you that have made our time here already so enjoyable. The last two nights that we've come to the pulpit, we have been in right in the middle of a move of God. And I didn't feel like I could take time to stop and say anything. But I want tonight to say thank you to Brother and Sister Tenney not only for their kind hospitality this week. Uh, I hope Brother Tenney never gets tired of me bugging him, but he is one of the first ones I call every time I've got a situation that I need an answer, a little bit of guidance and, and uh, wisdom. And he is always so kind to take time with me if he's not in to uh, quickly return a call and always so helpful. And if I need prayer, Sister Tenney has been used of God mightily to lead our fellowship through the directing of the World Network of Prayer, leading our fellowship into a dimension of prayer that I don't mind telling you in the 40 years that I've been a part of this United Pentecostal Church, we've never prayed like we're praying today. And I thank God for Sister Theodos Tenney and Brother Tom Fred Tenney and the leadership. Not only they're given in Louisiana, but let me speak for the whole United Pentecostal Church. These folks are a gift from God. Does anybody agree with me tonight? That is the fact. Appreciate Brother Tenney's message so much this afternoon. If you're going to put a message on the internet for everybody to see, that's the one that ought to go on there. That was a classic message today. Right straight from the throne. That was not intended to be a play on words. That really was a classic, not classic Coke, but just classic message today. And then Brother, Brother Treese, his teaching yesterday and today has been so rich. I will be thinking about the things that he has said for weeks and months to come after this conference is over. Brother Billy Cole, I was talking to him on the phone this afternoon, and he said, uh, what is Brother Treese teaching on? I said, well, I can tell you it's real, real good. You're just going to have to give me a little time before I can repeat it in such a way that anyone will understand it. But it was real good, and I appreciate what Brother Treese brought to us yesterday and today. And Brother Cornwell, I don't know where you're at, but he always blesses me. There he is, Brother Cornwell. I want to tell you what, folks. If there's ever been a day in the history of the world that we need to heed the call to reach the lost, it's today. I don't believe we have a whole long time to do it either I believe we're either going to have to get about the master's business or we're going to miss the final opportunity for the church to have end time worldwide sweeping revival I don't plan on missing it I don't plan on being somewhere up in the bleachers watching somebody else do it I've heard folks say for years that if we don't he'll raise up somebody else I don't believe that I don't believe that for one moment I'll tell you what I do believe. If we don't hurry up and do it, he's liable to build a fire under some of us to get us where we ought to be and doing what we ought to be doing. Can you say amen? Thank you, Brother Cornwell, for challenging us today. Thank you, everyone, for your kindness toward my wife and my family and myself. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 8. 
the eighth chapter of First Kings. I'm going to read verses one through four, and then I'm going to slip down and read verse number nine. After we read from First Kings, I also want to read just one verse of scripture from First Corinthians chapter one. First Kings chapter eight. Beginning in verse number 1, the Bible said, Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel, and all the heads of the tribes, the chiefs, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel, unto King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark. And they brought up the ark of the Lord and the tabernacle of the congregation and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle, even those did the priests and the Levites bring up. Verse number 9, There was nothing in the ark. Say that with me, will you? There was nothing in the ark, say save, two tables of stone. There was nothing in the ark, save the two tables of stone, which Moses put there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. Would you very quickly turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. My subject tonight, I want you to turn to your neighbor after I tell you what it is, and I want you to look at them and say it with me, if you will. My subject tonight is please stay for the preaching. Turn to somebody on the other side of you and say, please stay for the preaching. Brother Tenney, step out here again and ask God's blessings on us. Father, your blessing is already here. We acknowledge it. We praise you for it. May the anointing of the Holy Spirit move through this congregation. Place us under divine arrest. Let the angels of the Lord encamp round about this place. Let the word go forth with the power that's inherent to the word. Bless our brother. Open our ears and our hearts. You know why this message was given. We need it. In the name of Jesus. God bless you and you may be seated. I have been privileged the last several years to do quite a bit of traveling overseas. I have for the last 12 years visited Thailand at least once a year with Brother Billy Cole. I've been to Central America. I've had the privilege of preaching in Europe. I've got to go to some of the greatest revival hotspots of our day and around the world in various places and nations. Every now and then somebody will ask me, Brother Cunningham, why are they having thousands, multiplied thousands of people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost in this place or that place? Why are some of those things happening there that we are not seeing so much of it here in the United States of America? There are probably several answers to that question, but one of the things that sticks in my mind and probably was one of the first observances of mine the first time I went overseas, there seems to be a love among the people of Asia and of Central America and of Ethiopia and of Pakistan and the other places where we are having great revival. There seems to be a love for the Word of God there that is almost beyond the ordinary. These people love the preaching of God's holy word. When we go to Thailand, Asia every year, they start their first service at 6 o'clock in the morning. They go from 6 o'clock until 9.30. They take one hour for a mid-morning breakfast right there on the grounds that would amount to nothing more than soup that is boiled in big open pots. After they've had their soup and their rice, they come back 
into church about 10.30 and they stay till 1.30 or 2 in the afternoon. They sleep in the hardest, hottest part of the day and about 6 o'clock in the evening they are back in church and there they stay until 9.30, 10, 11 at night. They sleep on the floors of the sanctuary on straw mats. Literally thousands of them. They sleep in the backs of trucks. They sleep in the dust and the dirt all around the compound there in Thailand. And they're back up again and sitting in church at 6 o'clock the next morning. Brother Ewing has gone with us the last two or three years and he will testify to you that they are quite disappointed if we ever talk about shortening up the schedule just a little bit. We have five preachers. They want five preachers to preach. If we say we'll have three today and two tomorrow, they're very disappointed. They want five today and five tomorrow. They will sit there as long as you will preach the word of God and drink it in like a dry sponge that is hungry. I thank God for the United Pentecostal Church. I thank God for the preachers of the United Pentecostal Church. I thank God that we are people that love truth and we preach truth. And if there has ever been a day that our world needed to hear the clarion sound of truth, it's the day that we are living in today. Can you say amen? Amen. Right here in the United States of America, I am so concerned with the fact that we are absolutely being invaded by false religions. In the 1980s, the fastest growing religion right here in America was the Hare Krishna religion. In the 90s, the fastest growing religion right here in America is the Muslim religion. Are you aware that now the largest and the most expensive Buddhist temples in in the world are now in North America, not some third world country. The largest Buddhist temple in the world is in Los Angeles, California. The most expensive Buddhist temple ever built in history is in Vancouver, British Columbia. What are you trying to tell us, Brother Cunningham? If there has ever been a day, if there has ever been a need for the genuine anointed apostolic preacher to preach the truth without fear and favor and to shout the truth of the word of God from every housetop. It is the day that we're living in today. Will you shout hallelujah? Hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. There is a situation that is taking place in America that concerns me. I am concerned that in the last decade or so I have seen such a decay in our nation, a decaying uh, uh, in, in respect, in the areas of respect and appreciation toward the preacher, toward the ministry. I realize that there are areas out there where that hypocrisy and lavish lifestyle has probably brought some of the criticism on us uh, uh, because of the way some have lived. But there is an attitude today in the world and if we're not careful it's going to creep into the church. An attitude of relegating the place of preaching and the place of truth and the place of the word of God to something lesser than what God intended it to be and a lesser place than where God intended it to fill. Let me set the record straight. At the first part of this message tonight, the most important thing that happens every time we come together is the preaching of the Word of God. The reason there is such a decaying, I believe it's part of Satan's strategy for the end time. Brother Barnes and I, Brother Brother uh, Therese and I have discussed this a little bit over the last couple of days. There is a strategy that Satan would try to interject into the American church today. His strategy is outlined in the word of God. We don't need to be ignorant of it. The Bible tells us that if the devil or the enemy is successful at 
that's smiting the shepherd. That when the shepherd has been smitten, when the shepherd's influence has been decreased, then the sheep are going to scatter. That book tells us that without a vision, the people are going to perish. When I was about 13 years old, my grandfather took me to the state of Georgia on vacation with he and his wife and family. And when we got to Georgia, we went to visit an old Civil War fort. We were walking through that fort. My grandfather became intrigued with a little mound of dirt there and some cement statues of, of men that had been formed on top of that mound of dirt. Each of them had a long rifle in their hand, and my granddaddy asked, said, what, what does this mean right here? He said, well, those are the sharpshooters. Those are the men that had been given specific orders to shoot the leadership of the opposing army. They were not to shoot a normal soldier. They were not to bear down on just a private or just a mere sergeant, but they were to scan the line and look for the lieutenant stripes and the general's bars and the stars that would denote leadership. And when they found somebody that was in leadership, they would use that long rifle to shoot them knowing that if they could some way stop or slow the leadership, that they would be able to affect the outcome of the entire battle. Don't you know today, my friend, that if there's ever been a time that we needed to hold up the ministry, if there's ever been a time that we needed to love the ministry, if there's ever been day that we needed to pray for the preacher. It's the day that we live in today. Somebody shout hallelujah. I love the word. This church is a word church. We've got great singing in this church and I thank God for that. We have great musicians in this church. I thank God for that. We have districts that are as excellent as the Louisiana district is in organization and in administration and everything they do. And I thank God for that. But I want you to know that it's not administration. It's not organization. It's not music. It's not talent. It's not education. It's not ability that has brought us to where we are. We are where we are today because years ago, somebody built this church on a foundation of the word of God that word of God that is forever settled in heaven and that's what makes us what we are today somebody say hallelujah somebody say I believe it I get so tired of hypocrisy I get so tired of folks going through the motion. And you hear me, United Pentecostal Church. Our world is tired of hypocrisy in leadership and especially in areas of ministry. Hello? If you're going to get in a United Pentecostal Church pulpit, you need to be the real thing, honey. You need to preach the real thing. You need to live the real thing. I can probably extend that a little bit and say not just in the pulpit if you're going to get on an organ if you're going to get on a piano if you're going to grab one of these mics and sing if you're going to walk into a choir loft if you're going to enter any place of ministry in 1998 you need to be the real thing I was preaching in a church in Elizabeth, West Virginia. Now, there isn't anybody in here ever even heard of Elizabeth, West Virginia. Population about 380, Brother Tenney. I went there to preach them a little revival. They had about 50 in Sunday school. In three weeks, we had more than 50 get the Holy Ghost. We nearly doubled the church in three weeks' time. They had an old girl that played the piano there by the name of Charlene. Now, Charlene made me look tiny. She's a big old girl. And about half her teeth was missing. 
And every service, when you'd get there about 6.30 or 7 for prayer, Charlene was already there and in the prayer room. Whenever it come time to start service, Charlene was the only musician they had. She went out to the piano and began to bang on the piano. And to say she banged on the piano is complimenting. In three weeks' time, if she hit one note right, Sister Hudson, I promise you it was purely accidental. <laughs> one night after church, she came up to me and said, Brother Cunningham, said, God taught me how to play the piano. I thought, what a horrible thing to blame on God. <laughs> Let me tell you something about Charlene. Charlene went to the prayer room. Charlene brought a carload of people to church every night. Three-fourths of those people that got the Holy Ghost. Charlene brought them in her car. I went to another church to preach a revival right after that. Man, they had it all together. They had a brand new building, nice carpet, padded pews. They were in the middle of a great, big, wonderful, beautiful town. Had a church right on the highway. And when service time started, down the aisle walked a band of folks. I mean, one of the best piano players, guitar players, drummers, bass players, trumpeteer, you name it, they had it. They had quite a little band over there. And they'd come up and play their stuff. And I think musicians call it tight. They were, they were tight. Everything was together. They played good. They sounded good. It was smooth. Everything was right. But for the three nights that I was there preaching, the moment I stood up and read from the Word of God, they walked away from their instruments down the side aisle, out into the vestibule, the vestibule had glass doors on it, so I had to watch them while I was preaching, sitting out drinking Coca-Cola and eating cheese crackers and telling jokes all the time I'm preaching. After two good nights, the pastor come to me and he said, Oh, Brother Cunningham, we're enjoying having you with us. It's just a blessing to have you here. And Brother Cunningham, if there's anything that we can do for you to make your stay a little better, you just tell us what it is. I said, anything? He said, anything. We'll do it if we can, whatever it is. I said, here's what it is. You tell the musicians, I said, please stay for the preaching tonight. I'm going to preach to them. I said, tell him to stay in here. Tell him to go sit on the front row and let me preach at him. He said, oh, Brother Cunningham. He said, my musicians are temperamental and they got chips on their shoulder. And he said, some of them's already bounced from church to church. And he said, if I give them a little trouble, why, they'll just bounce off somewhere else. I said, sir, thank God and Greyhound, they're gone. Let them go. If they don't love God any more than that, if they don't care anything more about ministry than that, we don't need them on our platform. I like for things to be done right I like it when perfection is there I like it when excellence is there but honey if I've got to choose between a bunch of backsliders and, and, and old Charlene I'm going to choose Charlene every time My God, my God. We're fixing to move in the most apostolic era that the world has ever known. And honey, hear me. I want a revival. I want to be everything God wants us to be. But we can't do it if we let loose a him. My God. In 1 Kings chapter 8, Solomon brings the ark back 
to the temple in Jerusalem. That ark had been captured by the Philistines, but they didn't want it too long. It caused them so much trouble. Everywhere they set it, it tore something up around it. Finally, they put it on a cart, hooked a cow to it, and the Bible said the cow headed back toward Israel, lowing as it went. And when they sent that cart home, the Bible says it first went to the house of Obed-Edom. And then David brought it from the house of Obed-Edom just a little bit further. And then David went down to the city of David, and he picked up that ark, and he worshiped before God, and brought it into a temporary temple. And then the Bible tells us in 1 Kings chapter 8 that Solomon wanted that tabernacle in that new temple where it belonged. And so he sent all the priests down, all the Levites down, all the men of God down to get the ark. And we're going to follow all the rules. And we're going to bring the ark to the temple. That's what happened in 1 Kings 8. And at the ninth verse... Of First Kings chapter 8 we find the priest opening the ark for the first time since it's been back from the Philistines there's not a record in the scripture brother Tenney where that that ark had been fooled with other than the one fellow that put his hand against it and died nobody it's recorded that nobody touched that ark it's the first time it's been opened up since it's come back to the people of God from the Philistines and the Bible tells us that when they opened up the ark all they found inside of the ark was the tables of stone the law that God had given the commandments that God had given unto Moses that's all that was in the ark you say brother Cunningham is that significant it is because when that ark disappeared when that ark went down to the Philistines there was some other things in the ark there was in that ark a pot of manna that reminded the children of Israel of the sustenance and the power of God to take care of his people there was also in that ark Aaron's rod that budded that represented God's miracle working power among them. But when the ark come back, the pot of man is gone. When the ark come back, Aaron's rod that budded is gone. The only thing that's left in the ark is the tables of stone. I present to you that when the Philistines got that ark in their hands, the first thing that intrigued them was that rod of Aaron's that budded. We want to know something about the miraculous. We want the miraculous among us. We'd like to have some of the miracles that Jehovah God is doing for Israel. We'd like to have them among us. And then there was that pot of manna that they had to have been so caught up with. Remember the story how that every morning they went out and the manna fell and that for years God fed his people with sweet manna that fell from heaven and somebody gathered a pot of it up and said put it in the ark so that we'll never forget that our God's a provider so that we'll never forget that our God is a sustainer and the Philistines said we want to know God like that we want him to be a sustainer we want him to be a provider we want to see his miracles but what's these other things why these are the commandments this is the law of God I can see some big old Philistine soldier leader general he said put those things back in the ark we're not interested in that we want the manna and we want the rod but we're not interested in the book hello and so when the, when the ark came back and they opened it up the first time since it's been in the hands of the Philistines, there's nothing in it but the stone. They wanted to keep the pot of manna. They wanted to keep the rod that budded. They were hoping to have that kind of move of God among them. But we don't want nothing to do with those commandments. They are unimportant to us. The spirit of Laodicea. The age in which you and I are living today. That spirit of Laodicea is akin to the spirit 
of the Philistines in 1 Kings chapter 8. We are living in a day today where Laodicea loves Aaron's rod. They love the miracles. They love the gifts. They love the blessings. They love the deliverance. Their favorite message is name it and claim it and blab it and grab it. They want that kind of miraculous move among them. But they don't want the tables of stone. They don't want the responsibility of obedience. They don't want dedication. They don't want to sanctify themselves before the Lord. Just give us the rod. We want the miracles. They want that pot of manna. We want God to sustain us. We want God to love us. We want God to nurture us. We want God to care for us. But we don't want no part of that law of God. Too many requirements attached to it. Too many rules attached to it. Too many standards involved in obedience to that old word of God. That old law of God. You hear me tonight, United Pentecostal Church of the Louisiana District. I thank God for every preacher among us that's not afraid to preach the truth of the word of God. Without fear and without favor. They stand in our pulpit and preach God's word. I thank God for a preacher in my life who preached truth to me. I thank God for a preacher that lived the life before me. I thank God for my grandfather, Brother J.C. Cole, that was an old-fashioned one God preacher. Everybody said a one God preacher. Say it again, a one God preacher. My grandfather, it didn't matter where he read to you out of the book. He could stand up and say, church, tonight I'm going to do a Bible study on the love of God. And he could read that little old tiny verse that you'd think there'd be no problems. God is love. He'd get to the first word, God I want you all to know there's no S on that. He'd get to reading his Bible and it would say something about him. My granddaddy couldn't get by the word him. He'd say, folks, that's H-I-M, not T-H-E-M. He'd get talking about God and the devil, and he said, let me tell y'all something. It don't take three gods to whoop one devil. Say, Brother Cunningham, did you ever get tired of it? No. Did it ever get old to you? No. Did you ever wish you'd preach something else? No. Because he put something down inside of me. I believe it with every fiber of my being. I thank God for a preacher that'll preach the truth. been privileged to do the Pentecost Sunday three four years now Pentecostals of Alexandria about three or four years ago I walked into church on Sunday morning brother Anthony Mangum was already in his office tears streaming down his face when I walked in the office he stood up and embraced me with tears flowing he said Jack let me tell you why we got a great church here in Alex he said it's not me it's not Mickey it's not what we're doing he said let's go to the prayer room we walked out to the prayer room and there's brother G.A. Mangan out there walking back and forth in the prayer room and brother Brother Anthony said he didn't go home last night. He came over here during the night. He prayed all night long. He said, Jack, that man's a holy man. That man knows God. That man knows the book and loves the book. And that's why we are what we are today. My God. My God, my heart is heavy tonight. I believe with all of my heart that God blesses men that love truth. 
I believe with all of my heart that God will put his blessings on an anointed apostolic preacher. I've had people say, oh, Brother Cunningham, there's a great church over in that city because that's a good city to build a church in. Or there's a great church over here in this city because that's an easy city to build a church in. And Brother Cunningham, we can't have nothing over there. That's a hard city. I'm here to tell you God doesn't bless cities. God blesses men. Men that will sell themselves out to him. Men that will preach the truth. Men that he can trust with his anointing and power. Somebody shout, I believe it. Saint of God, you want your church to be blessed? Ask God to bless your preacher. Hello? You want your church to grow? Say, God bless my preacher. You want your church to have revival? Say, God bless my preacher. You want your church to have a tremendous program that will bring people from all over the city to see what's going on? Say, God bless my preacher. Because the more anointed that man is, the more anointed this pulpit will be, and the more anointed you'll be, and the more anointed God is going to move among this church in a city. I'm I'm 40 years old. People tease me. They've teased me on the platform tonight about computers and high tech. And Brother Cunningham likes gadgets. I do. I like high tech, nice equipment. I like for things to be right. My favorite word in administration and organization is the word excellence. I think if it's God's kingdom and you're going to do it, you need to do it right. Hello? Hello? I appreciate talent. Hear me when I tell you I appreciate the talent and the ability and the education and the tools that God has given us to work with. But you hear this 40-year-old preacher when I tell you that nothing will ever replace anointed preaching in an apostolic church. Nothing, I'm going to say it again, nothing will ever replace anointed preaching in an apostolic church. prophet Isaiah wrote and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing people walk into our churches they are bound up and you can write that down in capital letters they are bound up when they walk in our churches today they have so many problems they are so dysfunctional they are addicted to drugs and alcohol and a, and a multiplicity of habits they come from broken homes they have problems that, that just 10 years ago we never even dreamed of and when they walk through the doors of our church honey it's the anointing that's going to break the yoke it's not our programs it's not our talent it's not our socials it's not our functions it's the anointing that breaks the yoke I didn't say it the book says it the Bible tells us God chose preaching to save them that believe I said, God chose preaching to save them that believe. Forgive me tonight. I'm not trying to be ornery or mean, but God didn't choose a choir. God didn't choose a youth group. God didn't choose a ladies auxiliary. God didn't choose a music program. He didn't choose a fellowship. The book says God chose preaching. I'm going to say it one more time. The most important thing that ever happens when we come together is when a genuine man of God steps to the pulpit and opens up the bread of life and begins to break it under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. It ought to be the highlight of every service. It ought to be what we're here for. It ought to be what we're hungry for. Forgive my straightforwardness but I don't understand people who can sit like a knot on a log while anointed preaching is going forth I don't understand people that buck and snort and shout and jump and 
and run when the choir's singing and sit like they're dead while their pastor's preaching. Come on, somebody, we need to stay for the preaching. Somebody come up to me just a week ago and said, Oh, Brother Cunningham, you wouldn't believe the great service we had last Sunday night. We didn't have preaching. My granddaddy was old time. Forgive me. He put it in me. It's his fault. You can't get to him. He's already with the Lord. I was, I was on the platform one night, Brother Tenney, and I was waiting for my turn to preach. And they had let every dog and cat sing. And they shouted and run and jumped and had a hooping good time. My old grandpa walked over to me and put his arm around me and said, Son, if they shout till midnight, you preach till daylight. We're going to have preaching tonight. Don't you dare get me wrong. I love worship. I said, I love worship. I stood up with you and worshiped on every, every song we've sung. I stood here last night let the tears flow while we were singing about the blood. I love genuine apostolic worship. I love good godly singing. I've enjoyed this awesome choir tonight and every choir we've had all week long. But hear me, Pentecostals, if you can't worship unless there's a drum beating or somebody honky-tonking on a piano, something is wrong with your walk with God. If you're going to shout any time during a service, it ought to be when your precious pastor comes to the pulpit and begins to preach here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and him alone shall you serve. When he begins to preach, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That ought to make you shout. I don't have enough influence to do it here. But in my church where I pastored, I had a law that we lived by. And those of you that don't like laws, then don't go to my church. But I had a law that we lived by. The law said, if you don't shout with the preacher, you're not allowed to shout with the choir. You want to run and buck and jump and snort and jump pews while we're singing? You better do it while the preacher's preaching. If apostolic truth doesn't turn you on, honey, something's wrong in your relationship with God. Might as well go ahead and just tell you how I feel about it. We ought to have a law in this camp meeting. If you don't. Pastor at home, you don't have a right to shout at camp meeting. Oh, brother.
Brother Cunningham when Brother Tenney preaches or Anthony Mangan preaches or Jeff Arnold preaches. Boy, I want to shout. Honey, when your precious pastor comes to the pulpit next Sunday, you ought to slide out on the edge of the seat. And I don't care if you've heard it 10,000 times. When he begins to preach, you ought to get up just like you are right now. Say we worship in the man, Brother Cunningham, not on your life. But if he's a genuine one God, apostolic, tongue-talking, holy rolling preacher, when he begins to preach the truth that is power, the truth that is life, it ought to stir something in you. You may be seated. Hear me tonight, Louisiana District, the greatest asset that your church has. I said the greatest asset that your church has. It's not that new building you built. It's not the carpet and the pews. It's not all your high-tech equipment. Hello? Not how much ground you own on the interstate. The greatest asset that you have as a church, if you've got a preacher that's called of God and anointed by God, he is the greatest asset you have as a church. You hear me, United Pentecostal Church? There's nothing more point, uh, more powerful in an apostolic church service than anointed preaching. There is nothing more powerful in a service than anointed apostolic preaching. You want to have apostolic revival? Man, we want apostolic power. We want the apostolic miracles. We want the apostolic gifts. You know what we need? We need a little bit of apostolic submission. Hello? Hello? Some of us need to learn how to submit to the five-fold ministry. Don't get quiet on me. You were shouting just a minute ago. Mary, the mother of Jesus, came to Jesus at the wedding feast of Canaan in Cana of Galilee. And the Bible said she told him, they have no wine. He looked at her and gave a very negative answer. Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Can't get any more negative than that. Woman, it's not my problem. And if you're thinking I'm going to do a miracle, mine hour isn't come yet. Can't get any more negative than that. You know what brought about the first miracle recorded in the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ? Mary turned around. Stand up, Brother Chance and Brother Foster. You be Mary's servants here. Mary's talking to Jesus, and he gives her a pretty negative response. She turns around and looks at the servants and says, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. This is the hardest thing I'll preach this week. To a 1998 generation is to do what your pastor asks you to do without analyzing it, without trying to figure it out, without him writing you a 35 page summary of who, what, when, where, how, and why. said submit yourselves to them hello I better move on hadn't I we need to have a do it spirit hello preacher gets up and says folks we're going to have revival you need to holler we're going to do it we're going to go evangelize yes sir preacher we're going to do it we're going to give to missions yeah we're going to do it we got too many people that sit there with their arms crossed, their legs crossed, and their old nasty spirit crossed. And soon as church is over, they burn the telephone lines up. Yappity, yap, 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 yap. Say amen or oh me. 
My granddaddy said a pack of dogs going down the road. You heave a rock over in the middle of the pack of dogs. The one that yelps, the one got hit. Somebody walks out of here tonight and says, I don't like preaching like that. They got hit. Hallelujah. Do you realize that we've got people today in the church who actually feel they don't need a preacher? Hello? Some that are caught up in the rebelliousness of this generation. And they challenge everything the man of God says that we ought to be doing. We've even got some church boards. And some church cliques. And some preachers' families. That think they can dictate to the pulpit. It's getting quiet in Louisiana. Then there are those in the church that, of course, they feel like they're just as spiritual as the preacher is. And everything he says, well, we better run it by old sister spiritual, you know. Make sure it's from God. Hello? Hello? Miriam was Moses' sister. Miriam saved Moses' life. But later on in life, when they cross the Red Sea and come on the other side, she's talking to cousin Aaron. And they're whispering to each other, Brother Tenny, in the 13th chapter of Numbers. And they said, doth God speak only to Moses? Doesn't God speak to us sometimes? Can't we have a prophecy? Can't we have a word from God too? Is Moses the only one around here? And the Bible said, and God heard them. God spoke to Moses and said, tell Miriam and Aaron to meet me in the door of the temple, of the tabernacle. And God said to Moses, when they step into the door of the tabernacle, Moses, I want you to stand back because I'm going to kill them right there in the door. That's what, that's what the book says. God said, what'd they do? They said, doth God speak only by Moses? Don't, don't we get a word too? Is Moses the only one that can hear from God? He's not all perfect. He married an Ethiopian woman. And God heard him. I don't care if the preacher's your brother. I don't care if you taught him in Sunday school when he was a kid. I don't care if you've known him since he was a young evangelist. When he becomes your preacher, when he comes to the pulpit, he's God's mouthpiece. You better listen to what he's got to say. Let's stand together. I've been preaching too long. My God. My God. My God. If there's ever been a day that we needed to say, God, thank you for a preacher that's real, that lives the life, that's not afraid to tell me the truth. It's today. Isaiah, stay, stay standing. Isaiah paints the picture of two preachers in the book of Isaiah. On the one hand, he tells us about a preacher that stands on the wall that never leaves his post on the wall. He watches, the, Isaiah said, continually. And when danger approaches, the Bible said he cries out, Lion! All right. He announces when danger's coming. Yes. Isaiah said, on the other hand, there's a watchman over here that's nothing but a sleeping dog. He's always sleeping. He's always slumbering. He never sees danger approaching. He never sounds the alarm. He's only interested in what pertains to him. He doesn't care about his responsibility. You've got two different kinds of preachers, not only in the day of Isaiah, but in today's day. Hello? You got the blind dog. Come to him and say, Preacher, 
Anything wrong with me taking a second job is going to keep me out of church for the next six months? The old blind dog said, no, I can't see nothing wrong with it. How about me dating that girl that is a sinner girl? No, I don't see nothing wrong with it. How about me going to the bar with the boys on Friday and shooting a little pool because they make fun of me all week long because I don't go with them. I don't see nothing wrong with it. He's a blind dog. He's not going to tell you the truth. He's not interested in where your soul is going to spend eternity. But you go to the one that's standing on the wall. He understands his responsibility. He knows that his job is to get you to heaven. He wants you to be a part of the bride that's dressed in white and ready to meet Jesus. Can I date that girl that don't live for God? He puts his arm around you and says, I love you, son. You're a good boy, and I got, got, I got high hopes for you. But the Bible says, don't be unequally yoked together as with believer and unbeliever. Is he hard? No. He's sounding an alarm. He's a watchman on a wall. He's got his eyes open. He wants you to go to heaven. How about me taking a job? I miss church. He said, well, hear, hear me, sir. You got a wife. You got a kid. You need to bring them to the house of God. They need to be here. And the Bible says not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. That's what the book says. I don't want you to be somewhere else when Jesus comes. Hello? Hello? I'm a revivalist. I don't say this for anything, but just hopefully it's just a matter of fact statement. But for the last five years, I have given myself every waking minute of every day to the cause of revival. And because of that, I filter everything I do. Everything I say kind of goes through that revival filter. How does this affect revival? I went to Brother Barnes last night. I said, Brother Barnes, we're at the most crucial time in the history of the church in the world. What can we do to make sure we don't miss what God's doing? What insurance do we have? Is there some step I can take that will make sure we don't miss what God wants to do? And all night and all day, I've kept coming back to this over and over and over again. Tell my people that if they'll follow the preachers and tell the preachers that if they'll be apostolic and lead, I'm fixing to do something that they've only dreamed about to this day. I believe it's one of the missing ingredients. I think it's time for us to respect one another again. I I think it's time that we love one another again. I think it's time that we start praying for one another again. I think that it's time that we start honoring the great men of God among us again. We need to honor them. How does that affect revival, preacher? Smite the shepherd. The sheep are scattered. Without a vision, people perish. I'm in the Holy Ghost right now as much as I've ever been in my lifetime. I want you to join hands all over this building. All over this building. I want uh, Brother Barnes, would you get ready to come and pray for us? Get ready to come and pray for us in just a moment. Join hands all over this building. I want saints and preachers to join hands together. I want every human in this building to join the hands of the person beside you. And I want you to pray, God, listen to me. We need to turn this whole place into a repentance and rededication center tonight. God, if there's anything in me that shouldn't be there, take it out. God, if I'm doing or not doing something that pleases or displeases you, God, i got to be right. (laughs) Brother Barnes, would you come and pray for us? Oh, Lord, thou hast spoken unto us tonight. We have heard from heaven. The name of the Lord has been lifted up here. And this night, thou hast put your hand upon this service and the ministers in this place and the saints standing together.
Father, lifting their hearts unto you. We want to thank you. We want to thank you for the signs and the wonders you're performing among your people. Thank you, God, for raising up ministers and giving unto them the whole five-fold ministry. The hour has come. We must have apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers on fire, flaming evangelists, flaming ministers, that the world will be shaken and turned upside down for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Brother Ewing, step out here and say what's on your heart. Hallelujah. We're in the Holy Ghost here tonight, church. Brother Jack Cunningham and I are so dear friends. He stepped back just for a word of encouragement. Is it all right, Brother Ewing? Is it all right? I said, Brother Cunningham, you are in the Holy Ghost. Yes, it is. Because this yes, it is. is a key yes. to apostolic revival. Yes. We got to put the preacher in his right place and the message in its right place to have an apostolic revival. You know what I'm talking about being a deacon is you'll have a place of high standing. Oh, the... Would you raise your hands and make a new commitment to God tonight? It seems like this camp meeting has been a time of committing over and over again. But raise your hands and tell him, God, I'm going to support my preacher. I'm going to love my preacher. I'm going to pray for my preacher. And together we're going to have apostolic revival. God, together we're going to have apostolic revival. He da 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 ba ha sha ta da da ma ha ya. He ko ro da 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 ba ha sha ta da 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 ma ha ya. He ko ro da 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 ba ha shi ki on do da 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 ma ha da. He ka da 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 ma ha sha ta. Would you call your preacher's name in prayer? I want you to say it out loud. I want you to bless him. Come on, say it. Bless him. Bless him. God, I want you to bless my pastor. Bless my pastor. Say it out loud. <laughs> I want every preacher in here to pray the blessings of God on those that are following you, those that you have been given charge of in the Spirit. I want every preacher to put their hands in the air. I want you to pray God's blessings on your people. <laughs> I want every preacher and every saint in this building. I want you to raise your hands toward Brother Tenney. I want you to pray God's blessings on him. As he not only leads this district, but as he influences the church of today toward end time apostolic revival. Come on, pray blessings on him. I want you to pray God bless him. Ladies, pray for Sister Tenney. He da 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 ba ha sha ta da da ma ha ya. He ko ro da 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 ba ha sha ta da da ma ha ya. He ko to to yo da 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 ba ha sha ta. He ko to to yo da 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 ba ha ta. He ko to to yo da 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 ba ha na. He ka da 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 ba ha shi ki o to to yo da 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 ba ha ya. He ka ta da 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 ba ha shi ki an do da da ba ha ya. Some of you need to be praying right now, God. I want you to help me to carry the load that the leadership is carrying. God, I want you to let me feel the burden that they're feeling. God, I want you to help me to help them be a success in ministry. Yes. 
Mahina da Mahashata da Mahataya, he called on another Mahashata da Mahaya, he called on another Mahashiki on Nola da Mahaya. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I have a challenge for you, church. I have a challenge for you. There's no way to get the preachers in one place and all the saints come around them. This, this place is just not big enough. But let me challenge you that before you leave this camp meeting this week to go home, before you leave to go home, I want you to find your preacher and shake his hand, put your arms around his neck and his pastor's wife. And I want you to tell them we're going to go home and we're going to help you. And together we're going to have the greatest revival our city and our church has ever known. We're going to be workers together from now on. Let me tell you what I do not want you to do. I do not want you to go to your pastor and say, I've been gossiping all over the church about you. Forgive me. Don't go to your pastor and say, I've been against you forever. Forgive me. Don't want no confessions. Hello? Just go hug their neck and say, from now on, by the help of God, we're going to do what God called us to do in our city. Brother... Let's lift our hands and feel after God here tonight. I'll tell you what I feel in the Holy Ghost. He's been dealing with the preachers as well as the laity. Sometimes we preachers, we, we put on a plastic smile because, you know, they tell us keep up a good image. A lot of preachers are hurting today. Complicated society and all of it drains into the church. So many units of energy are pulled out of the preacher. Sometimes we don't have a clue to tell you what to do. But there's preachers here that need a special touch of God. Some of you came depressed. Oh, Brother Tenney, preachers never get depressed. Who told you that? Preachers discouraged. Some of them pulling a heavy load because of a lack of unity and cooperation. I'm going to tell you, unity is the key to revival. Brother Tekla Marians told us over and over in Ethiopia where a million people have got the Holy Ghost, we never pray for revival. We pray for unity because when unity comes, revival comes. I'm going to give an altar call tonight for preachers that need a fresh touch. And I know what some of you are thinking. Same thing I think. If I come down there, Brother Tenney, what will the people think? I must miss something somewhere. I didn't think we came to the front to pray to get before people. I thought we came to get before God. Say, your images have feet of clay. We got some hurting preachers today. They've been trained and pulled. No, they're not perfect. No, they don't have all the answers. If you don't feel it, don't come. It's all right. I'll to call for preachers. God, some of you came saying, God, I got to have direction at that camp meeting. All direction is from the altar. I got a sermon on that. If you need direction, let's get it the altar. anointing. God bless you. This will be the conclusion. It's up to you. But I want gifted prayer warriors in here that feel led of the Holy Ghost. Not just necessarily preachers, but if you feel led to come down here and pray and even pray for one of these preachers. Any of you preachers that feel like it. The Lord wants us to band together in praise. If you can't get down here, you can kneel where you are. We're going to turn this tabernacle into an altar. God bless you.
if you don't want to pray, you're dismissed. But I want you to feel a special burden. Maybe your pastor's down here. That you'll come. Maybe you're another preacher and God leads you to one of your brothers. Come